New York wakes up under a snowstorm. In the gray sky, a Delta Airlines MD-88 slowly approaches LaGuardia, one of the most challenging airports in the United States. The captain and his first officer know that runway 13 is short, that the margins are minimal, and that the snow can turn any mistake into something irreversible. During the descent, every calculation, every word, and every second count They've received reports of good braking action, but visibility is poor and no one can guarantee that the surface is truly in safe condition. March 5, 2015, Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, Atlanta, USA. It's 8 a.m., and here, the crew of Flight 1086 is finishing up the pre-flight preparations for a departure scheduled in just 30 minutes to New York. The planned route for Delta Airlines, Flight 1086, connected two of the busiest and most demanding airports in the United States, Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson and New York's LaGuardia. A short domestic flight, just about an hour and a half, that on paper seemed routine on that March 5, 2015. Delta's flight was set to take off from the heart of the southern United States and head northeast, following a path that would take it up the east coast, straight toward the New York metropolitan area. Its destination, LaGuardia, is no ordinary airport. Nestled between densely populated neighborhoods, surrounded by water, and with significantly shorter runways than most airports in the country. That morning, the weather conditions along the route were wintry, but manageable. However, in New York, the weather front was rapidly intensifying. The aircraft assigned to the flight was a McDonnell Douglas MD-88, registration N909DL, one of the most iconic models in the Delta Airlines fleet. Built in 1987, it was part of the MD-80 series, a direct descendant of the classic DC-9, a design that had proven its reliability for decades. With a capacity of around 150 passengers, it was an ideal aircraft for medium-range domestic routes like the one connecting Atlanta and New York. Equipped with a combination of analog and digital instrumentation, it represented the transition between classic aviation and the modern era. Its maintenance record and performance in adverse conditions had made it a highly valued model among Delta crews, who had operated it regularly for years. The aircraft had logged over 71,000 flight hours and more than 54,000 takeoff and landing cycles, with no recent reports of anomalies and all inspections completed within the required timeframes. Delta Airlines, founded in 1925 and based in Atlanta, is one of the oldest and largest airlines in the world. It operates thousands of daily flights across the US and to more than 50 countries. In 2015, its fleet combined modern models like the Boeing 737 and Airbus A320 with veteran MD-88s and MD-90, true icons of its domestic routes. Flight 1086 was just another part of that daily routine of national connections, at least on the surface. At the controls of Flight 1086 is Captain Theodore W. Lauer, 56 years old, with 15,200 hours of flight experience around 11,000 of those in MD-88 aircraft. Alongside him in the cockpit is First Officer David W. Phillips, 46 years old, with 11,000 total flight hours, 3,000 of them in MD-88s. Rounding out the crew are three flight attendants. In total, 132 people are aboard the MD-88, 127 passengers and five crew members. After a short delay, at 9.23 a.m., the aircraft begins accelerating down the runway. They take off without issue and begin their journey toward LaGuardia Airport. The climb proceeds without incident 
The aircraft passes through scattered cloud layers and soon levels off at cruising altitude, heading northeast over North Carolina. During the flight, the atmosphere in the cockpit is calm, though the crew remains focused on monitoring the weather. At 9.54, while the MD-88 is still cruising, the crew begins analyzing the situation in New York. The latest reports indicate moderate snowfall, reduced visibility, and a low cloud ceiling, but controllers report no runway closures. The captain remarks, according to this, we're at the crosswind limits. The first officer contacts the dispatcher via the airline's messaging system to request the latest update for LaGuardia. The response comes in minutes later. Breaking action advisories, taxiways with snow accumulation, runways wet and chemically treated. The two pilots review the MD-88's performance data in the operational manual. They calculate that runway 13, at 7,003 feet long, only offers a safety margin if breaking action is good. With medium or poor values, the required landing distance would exceed the available length. The captain is clear. If the runway isn't in good condition, we don't land. The flight continues over Virginia. Washington Center instructs them to hold over the Robbinsville Vor. LaGuardia is temporarily closed for snow removal. The news causes some frustration in the cockpit. They hadn't been informed beforehand. Shortly after, the controller asks if they can accept an instrument approach to runway 13. The first officer replies yes, but insists, only if we have reports of good braking action. At that moment, no reports are available. The runway is still under maintenance. At 1047, the controller reports that a Delta aircraft that just landed reported poor braking action. But shortly afterward, another flight, a United Airbus A319, reports good runway conditions. This contrast raises doubts, but the information from United matches the latest ATIS update. Wet runways, treated with sand and desync fluid, no visible snow accumulation. The captain makes the call. Let's give it a try. At 10.53, the controller provides the latest weather report. 400 meters visibility with snow and fog, runway visual range of 1,800 meters. The crew notes the data and continues the descent. The captain, still not fully convinced, asks for a wind check. Request wind direction and component again. The controller replies that the wind is 0 to 0 degrees at 10 knots, essentially a tailwind for runway 13. With that information, the captain adds five knots to the reference speed to maintain a control margin. The approach follows the ILS procedure. The aircraft finally breaks out of the clouds at about 300 feet above the ground, and what the crew sees doesn't match expectations. The runway is completely white, covered in snow. At 11.02, the MD-88 touches down smoothly at a speed of 133 knots. Visibility is poor, the landscape a white blanket, and the captain applies reverse thrust almost immediately. The first officer says, Spoilers up! But the automatic system doesn't respond, and he has to deploy them manually. Within seconds, the aircraft begins to drift slightly to the left. The co-pilot warns, Two in reverse. Thrust increases, but so does the lateral deviation. Get out of reverse, the first officer shouts seconds later. Too late. The aircraft veers completely off the center line, crosses the snow-covered safety area, and crashes into the airport perimeter fence, continuing another 270 meters before coming to a stop, with its nose hanging over the Flushing Bay embankment. From the cockpit, the captain shuts down the engines and orders a check on the passengers. In the rear, the flight attendants try to communicate with the cockpit, but the PA system is down. After a few minutes, they see emergency crews arriving through the windows and decide to begin evacuation. The front slides deploy, passengers descend into the cold and snow, and on the ground, 
Firefighters and Port Authority police guide them to a safe area. Everyone makes it out safely, though some suffer minor injuries. The aircraft is severely damaged. Flight 1086 is over, no fatalities, but a thorough investigation is about to begin. What had happened? Who was to blame for this disaster that nearly became a catastrophe? The hours following the accident were chaotic. LaGuardia Airport remained closed, and Delta's MD-88, still perched on the embankment, became a symbol of what could have ended in tragedy. That same day, the NTSB dispatched a team of investigators to New York to determine what had occurred in the final seconds of Flight 1086. The first thing that drew attention was the aircraft's final position, stopped on the embankment that separates the runway from the bay, with the nose hanging over the edge, and the left wing destroyed after tearing through nearly 300 meters of perimeter fencing. Maintenance crews began removing snow and spilled fuel as investigators photographed every detail. The skid marks on the runway, the tracks across the grass, shards of metal, and frozen mud on the landing gear. The cockpit voice recorder was recovered the same day, along with the flight data recorder. Both were in perfect working order. The NTSB confirmed the CVR contained the last two full hours of recordings, and the FDR held about 25 hours of flight data. These revealed that Flight 1086 had conducted a fully stabilized approach. The aircraft crossed the runway threshold at 133 knots, within expected parameters, and touched down almost exactly on the centerline. Everything pointed to a flawless landing. But six seconds after touchdown, something changed. The EPR, engine pressure ratio, indicating reverse thrust, began to rise rapidly. According to Delta's operational manual on wet or snowy runways, the recommended limit is 1.3 EPR to avoid losing directional control. In the case of Flight 1086, the recordings showed thrust reaching 1.9 and at times exceeding 2.0 on the left engine. Investigators were well aware of the consequences. At such high power settings, the reversed airflow generated by rear-mounted engines can render the rudder ineffective, an aerodynamic phenomenon known as rudder blanking. Simply put, the blast of air directed forward by the reverse thrust disrupts the airflow needed over the vertical stabilizer, causing the rudder to lose effectiveness precisely when the pilot most needs it to keep the aircraft aligned. Captain Lauer stated that he tried to maintain centerline control with right rudder pedal input, but the aircraft just wouldn't respond. The first officer confirmed that the thrust reversers had deployed properly, the spoilers were extended manually, and the auto brake was set to maximum, yet the aircraft kept veering left for no apparent reason. By the time the captain reduced power in an attempt to regain control, the drift was already unrecoverable. The MD-88 crossed the snowy safety area, destroyed part of the runway edge lighting, and ended up on the embankment. Upon examining the runway, the NTSB found that the tire marks began exactly where the aircraft started to veer off. Confirming that the brakes were functioning and that the issue didn't lie in the hydraulic systems or traction. The cause had to be found elsewhere, in the management of reverse thrust. The pilots had decided to land at LaGuardia because previous reports, relayed by the tower and control center, indicated good braking action. That information came from two aircraft that had landed minutes earlier, but when investigators reconstructed the timeline, they discovered that more than 25 minutes had passed between the last snow removal and Flight 1086's touchdown. In the middle of winter with ongoing snowfall, that was more than enough time for the runway to become snow-covered again. Airport records also showed that no actual friction measurements had been taken after the last clearing, and that the information relayed to the pilots was based on the subjective impressions of other flight crews. The NTSB highlighted a deeper issue. 
The reliance on verbal reports and the lack of a standardized method for communicating exact pavement conditions in real time. In other words, Captain Lauer landed believing he had a runway in good condition, when in fact the surface was far more slippery than the reports had indicated. The MD-88 was a veteran model, with powerful rear-mounted engines and a sensitive directional control system. The investigation determined that, in such conditions, reverse thrust above 1.6 EPR was enough to almost completely nullify the rudder's ability to correct lateral drift. Simulators used by the NTSB confirmed that, in an identical scenario, the aircraft began veering left in less than five seconds, and that the only way to stop the drift was to drastically reduce reverse thrust, something that in this case was done too late. Another critical issue was the evacuation. The impact damaged the interphone and PA systems. The CVR captured the cabin crew attempting to contact the cockpit with no response. They didn't receive an official evacuation order until several minutes later, once emergency vehicles were visible outside the aircraft. The full evacuation took 17 minutes, longer than the FAA's established standards. The NTSB noted that while the evacuation was ultimately successful, the lack of coordination and internal communication could have caused confusion or unnecessary delays in a more serious scenario. The official report, AAR 16-02, published in 2016, was clear and direct. The probable cause of the accident was the captain's inability to maintain directional control of the airplane due to the application of excessive reverse thrust, which reduced the effectiveness of the rudder to control heading. Among the contributing factors, the NTSB listed the psychological pressure of landing on a short snow-covered runway, the misinterpretation of braking action reports, the lack of cockpit alerts or visual limits regarding maximum reverse thrust values, the absence of objective friction measurements after the last runway clearing, The conclusions of the report led to significant changes. Delta revised its manuals and reinforced recommendations to limit reverse thrust on contaminated runways. Shortly after, the FAA implemented the new TALPA RCAM system, which standardizes runway condition assessments and replaces the old subjective descriptions like good or fair with numerical values and objective friction categories. The NTSB also recommended developing alternative communication protocols for situations where the PA or interphone system fails and called for joint training between pilots and cabin crew for such scenarios. In the end, Delta Flight 1086 resulted in 29 minor injuries, all of whom were discharged within a day or two, and a total loss of the MD-88N909DL due to structural damage. Sometimes in aviation, accidents don't arise from a single obvious failure, but from a combination of subtle factors. A weather report interpreted too optimistically. A runway slicker than expected. A slight excess of thrust that goes unnoticed. None of those factors alone would have caused a disaster. But together, at the exact time and place, they turned a routine landing into an event that came seconds away from ending in the water. Delta Airlines Flight 1086 claimed no lives. And that makes it a story of warning rather than mourning. Investigators learned from it, airlines adjusted their procedures, and winter airports improved how they communicate runway conditions. The snow melted at LaGuardia, the runway was repaired, and the MD-88 became part of history. But its story lives on, teaching something essential. In flight, precision is measured not only by instruments, but by the judgment of those who interpret them.